Welcome to Conversations Live. For more than a decade, we've brought you the best in books, entertainment, celebrity interviews, and current events. When the movers and shakers of the world have something to say to you, they say it to us first. Here's your host, Cyrus Webb. Welcome back, everyone, to Conversations Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again. But for a radio audience tuning in at WYAD 94.1 FM and WYADonline.com here in Mississippi, we're glad that you all could be with us. Also, tuning in to our friends at iHeartRadio and Amazon Music Podcast, we're glad you all could be with us as well. For those who are looking as an example of someone who has been able to go through different challenges and come out better the other side, I think you guys are going to really enjoy our next guest and the book he's been able to write. My guest is Andrew Minot. We're going to talk about his book book prove him wrong, the importance of the message about his own life that he's been able to share, but I think also the inspiration he gives all of us as well. If you guys are not staying connected with Andrew, we will let you guys know where to find him, as well as how you can get your copy of Prove Him Wrong as well. But Andrew, thank you so much again for the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate being here, too. appreciate it. Thank you. Look, the pleasure is definitely all mine. You know, you've been able to achieve so many things in your life, Andrew, but I want to talk about this new slash behind your name. I mean, people know you for music, but what has it been like for you now to be able to share your story and to carry the title of author? Wow, it's it's very surreal. Even last night I was talking to someone, and they were telling me congratulations, and I was like, Man, it is so surreal because I've never dreamt in a million years to do a book. You know, it mm-hmm. just it, when people said, you know, it's a kind of cliche when said it just kind of happened. Literally, it did just happen. Happen. There, there was never any intention of writing a book at all. You know, yeah. but you know, it's been good though. It's been good. And, and I think the other thing about your story, uh, Andrew, and what I love, too, I mean, there's a lot of history in this book. You're able to take, you know, we've all heard that saying, Andrew, a picture's worth a thousand words. You give us the pictures from different chapters of your life. So when you kind of look back on it, is, did it seem like it was inevitable, though, that you would want to tell your story because of the things you've been able to experience and what you've been able to learn? Yes, you know, looking back, it, I think it's going to be a great thing that people can actually learn from it because I've always been that type of person to, like, try to help others and teach others. But I've also been a very private person. So mm-hmm. my whole life is on front page right now, you know. So it's, it's something that I've never done. I've always been behind the scenes. Even when I did concerts and huge events, I stayed behind the scenes because I was never, like, an upfront person. Instead of being on the stage, I'd be behind the stage. So that was always yeah. me. But looking back and reading the book over and, getting a feel for it. I get emotional even reading my own story because I never intended for this to happen. It's like seeing my own life flashing through my eyes, like I'm just seeing it like in sequences from my early days growing up in Jamaica, coming to the U.S. and going through my whole life. Someone said to me yesterday, um, it reads like a movie, and I was like kind of flattered. I was like, wow. And they were like, yeah. I was like, because of how it, it... it showed my life from growing up all the way up to my present time right now. So right. It's, it's just different. Well, this is definitely something that's personal for you. And you, when you and I had our first chat together, and I want to shout out Mr. Angelo Ellerby for connecting us, I said to you when uh, I think you would ask me about my takeaways from the book, and what I thought was so interesting about the book, uh, Andrew, and we'll talk about a bit of that today, is that, I think no matter where people are from, it reaches them where they are. I think we all have been in situations where someone has told us what we can't do, who we can't be, what we can't achieve. And then some of us then decide, you know what, if this is really what I want to do, I'm going to prove them wrong. You say in the beginning of the book something I actually want to read. You say, I wanted to prove the naysayers wrong. I wanted to prove my grandparents wrong. I wanted to prove the world wrong. But I know for sure a lot of my fire and fight and focus was on proving my father wrong. I wanted to show him that he missed the opportunity of a lifetime to have me as his son and to be there for me and my brothers. Talk about that, that very personal connection to this, Andrew, and why it was important for you to make something of yourself. Wow. You, you know, by you just reading that, it took me back, and it's like whew, a surreal moment for a second. Um, my father was never there, and when you that part in the book, like when I came to America and he said, so what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I want to go to college. 
it's just the natural response that a child would make to their father. Mark you, I'm only 18 years old. And I said right. that. And he said, who's going to pay for it? I said, you are. I just think it was a natural thing for him to say, yeah. It's not like it was, I'm asking for like $10,000 a semester. It was like $23 a credit hour. It was cheap. And he was like, no, I'm not. I was like, huh? So then the disappointment of me, like, hearing that from his mouth, that he's not paying for it, I'm like, so I'm saying, so why did I even come here? Why are you even sent them? I realized then he didn't really want us to be here. He just felt like, okay, I'm just going to do something for you because you know what? Okay, I'm going to bring you to America. But you brought me here and didn't set a foundation for me. You know, basically nothing. Then you tell me that you're paying the rent for like a month and a half and you're on your own after that. So I'm like, what? You know, it, it was just kind of, so I had to prove him wrong because basically he never gave me a chance because he, he figures that, you know what, you're going to be no good anyway. You know what, you're not going to mount nothing in your life, which he said that to me. And basically, you know what, I had to prove him wrong. The naysayers, because people always say, you know, when you're young, oh, you'll never mount to anything. I was talking to a classmate of mine that we went to school together in high school, and he said, we bought, I brought up a teacher to him because we both played soccer, and confidence is a hell of a thing when you're growing up. When you're growing up and you don't have confidence instilled in you, and that can really set you back because you then, you sometimes you'll be a recluse, you don't really speak to people, and then you're like, you, you don't think you can do anything. So they basically, all those people, you had to prove all of them wrong and say, you know what, I'm going to make something of my life and show you all. You know, just like the story of Michael Jordan. They told him that he was gonna, he's going to pump gas at a gas, he's going to go knock on and on the bench and then work at a gas station and pump gas for the rest of his life. You know, everybody has a story, man, that you got to prove somebody wrong that doubted you. And, you know, it's just the way it is. And I had to, like, bring that story out that people, and I know a lot of people can relate to a lot of these stories, so... It's a, it's a good thing for me right now, basically. Yeah, and and as you were talking just now, Andrew, I thought about you mentioned the um, and I remember that episode in the book um, when you were talking to your father about college. And I think there is something though. You did have a moment almost of karma um, that that came back to you. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about that briefly, but also a full circle moment because you talk about it in your book uh, when it comes to your son Henry. You know, and you all had an encounter, and you literally say in the book that sounded like some BS. My father basically said to me when he said no, when you want, when when you wanted to go to college, uh, and 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 I I love I love that you're able to have that and that honesty there. Talk to us about that though. What was it like for you? Because I think that people are going to be able to relate to this, Andrew. That you know, sometimes when we're trying so hard to go away from something. Uh, because of those things that can be so ingrained and can come up, we find ourselves exactly where we don't want to be. What was that that exchange like for you to think about? It was very difficult um, because it, it, unlike the difference with my father and with my son, is that I was always open to talking to my father as much as I never saw him, never knew him, never interacted with him. My son Henry was basically taken away from me. So by me reaching out to him and like, and he's just shunning me and I'm saying to him, why, why are you doing this? Why, you know, and he's just like, don't want to say anything. I don't want to talk and all that. And then I said, because your mother told you all these stories about me, oh, she didn't say anything. So I'm saying, give me a reference point. Why would you be like this towards me if your mom didn't say anything about me? You know, if, if, I'm, if you're, you have a blank slate, and I'm, I'm basically, if I'm a deadbeat, then I, I was never there. At least give me a chance to, like, talk to you. But then it, it becomes a point where it's like you're fighting for something and they, they're pushing away from you. And I got, yeah. really, I got really upset to the point where I like, you know what? You know what? It's fine. Have a good life. And then he responded to me and said what he said. And, you know, that really, like, burned me in the sense of I'm here trying it's not like I discarded you. I fought to, to have you in my life. I did. And then basically up and gone. So these are the things that he could have looked into and, and rationalized for himself and say, you know what? Okay, I'm, let me give you a chance. Speak your piece. You didn't give me a chance to do that. 
But right. you see, with like, my father, I tried as much as he was never there at all, and I tried. And, you know, it, yeah, it comes around full circle, though, but, you know, all we can do is try. That's right. And I think that's why this book is going to be so powerful, Andrew, and I'm so glad we have you here to talk about it now and then in the series we have coming up as well. I want to say for those who are just tuning in, though, either on the radio side or online, you're listening to Conversations Live. My guest today is Andrew Minot. We're talking about his powerful new book called Prove Him Wrong. I'm going to remind you you guys can stay connected with Andrew, uh, but also to uh, get your copy of the book. Andrew, the other thing that keep people probably have gotten to know you for that comes up in the book is your love of music. And it's something that does play a very big role uh, in your life, especially in the people you're able to meet. In Chapter 5 of the book, you said this, I just wanted to do music so bad. Everybody was telling me that I couldn't get it done. I think that because it was just me, Andrew Minot, husband, father, son, brother, I had this hunger to do the music, to do the concert, to prove everybody, including myself, that I was smart enough to do it, even as I was winging it. I want to talk about that. What was it about music that connected with you in such a way that made you say this was something you wanted to do? Um, funny enough, I always loved music. Even um, a lot of people like know me, they said I was always like trying to sing and all that. And they said, well, you can't sing. And I'm like, well, <laughs> Sugar Miner can sing. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, and they said, well, you're not Sugar Miner. I said, well, it's in my blood. So what are you talking about? Because Sugar Miner is known as one of the sweetest reggae singers of all time. You know, he has that melody in his voice. And so that's what gave me the recognition. My last name, Minot, when a lot of people say, oh, you relate to Sugar Minot? I'm like, yeah, my cousin. And he actually got me, like, back in 1991. i never forget. Um, I was at his house. And I said, I want to do music. I want to do music. I'm young and I'm hype. And he said, you sure this is what you want to do? And I said, yeah, yeah, I want to do this. I want, you know, yeah. And he looked at me, and he looked at me dead in my eye, and he said, you sure this is what you really want to do? And I'm like, what? And I, he made me take a step back, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, he said to me, no, I got your attention, right? And he said, basically, if you don't truly love music, don't do it. Because the whole music industry, the business, is so corrupted and so bad, it, wow. it will force you to hate people. And he gave me real in-depth, because at that time, in 1991, he had over 70 recorded albums, over 70. When he died in 2010, he had over 100 albums that was released. And he said he, not, he didn't get the recognition he, he deserved and any of that stuff. And he was like, look at me. And he said, I love the music so bad, I never, I never put people above anything else. Like, basically... He still loved humanity. As, as bad as they treated him and didn't give, me, give him his just due, he still loved it. And that's what motivated me. And that was like back in 1991. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to look at it like that. And basically, he inspired me to really, truly look into the in-depth of music. And that's what made me like start to have that passion and that drive for music because of him. Did you realize that it would open up the doors that it did? I mean, you uh, you were able to meet a Academy Award winner, now Academy Award winner that we have been seeing on television a lot. You talk about meeting her in the book and being able to spend time with her. Could you imagine that that gift of music would open up the doors that it has? Wow, I, <laughs> that was like that was just a weird moment because, funny enough. Um, the, there's a picture with me and Sugar Minor that, that we took that same year, that same time when I met Cheryl. And we, it was Reggae Stumpfest in Jamaica, and I was traveling with Red Rat. And we were at the hotel in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and I saw her in the elevator, and I was like, wow. I said, that's, it was like a wild moment. I was like, okay. Mm. And then I saw her when we were getting ready to leave to go to the venue, we were waiting on the cars to pick us up. And I saw her, and I was like, okay. And we're like, hey, how you doing? And then I saw her at the venue backstage, and basically was like, damn. I was like, you know, then we just started talking, and basically she didn't know who I was. I knew who she was, and she had she she really loved being a man at the time. And 
I'm I'm really close to Beanie Man because I've done concerts with him. And when I saw Beanie Man came and I said, hey, Cheryl, want to meet you and stuff. And then when she saw how I interact with Beanie Man, she was like, who, who are you? But again, because I was always a low profile person, you know, <laughs> and pretty much now, and she's all over social media, all over TV now. She's actually doing, singing the, um, she's singing at the Super Bowl. So mm-hmm. it was, it was, it was a wild moment, I must say. Yeah, yeah. When I got to that part of the book, I was like, "Wow, imagine that! Perfect timing for your book to come out, Andrew." <laughs> uh, I mean, that definitely could not have planned that any better. The last thing I want to talk to you about, Andrew, and this is a, another powerful part of the book. Um, and this is something I want our audience to really listen to. I talk about it a lot on this broadcast, uh, as well as my other platforms, Andrew. And that is the importance of taking care of self. And we as men, we do not do it enough. Um, we are, I think society has made us feel as though, you know, we're not supposed to be thinking about ourselves, it's supposed to be about our family, it's supposed to be about our kids, or if we're married, you know, about our spouse. But you realize the detriment that can come from not making sure that you're okay. In Chapter 10 of the book, if you're talking about, ironically, your relationship with rage as the title of the book, um, of that chapter talks about, you say this, uh, and I want to actually read this when we talk about it on page 116 of the book. You said, my anger showed up in my relationship when I was disappointed and didn't think I was enough or when it was over and I couldn't just leave. I stayed because I didn't want to disappoint anybody. But I look back and realize that I was disappointing myself. Maybe that's where the rage came from within. I was spending so much time making sure my kids, friends, family, and artists were good that I forgot all about me. Talk about that realization because that's a lot to admit to yourself. What was it like for you to admit to yourself that you had left yourself behind? Wow. Um, Man, all these lines always get me um it's 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 the point where i always put myself last it's it's always been me i will i will give my last dog to somebody and go hungry it's it's just my nature and i've always just been that person probably because from the time when my father basically neglected me and i said you know what if i can change one person's life and I've always put that above myself. For whatever reason, I always, like, put everyone ahead of myself. My family, my kids, wife, brothers, everybody, I put them ahead of myself. Like, and that's always been me. When I joined the Navy and my brother was still struggling, like, in Jersey, and I felt guilty in the sense of I left him also, so I had to make sure he was good. So I sent direct deposit to my bank account, and he had access to everything. So I gave him, I said, you know what, you can take all the money. I don't care. Because I was, I was in the Navy. They gave me meals. I, had, I was good. So I always put everybody ahead of myself. And I look back and reading the, and writing the book, I said, maybe I shouldn't have done that like that. And I, I do have certain regrets doing that. Because it, it fuels my rage when I think about it and disappointments when a lot of times, and people can relate to this, like right. you give someone, you give and give and give, and then it's never reciprocated. And then people get really bitter about that. And you, you get angry because another friend of mine, when I, when I used to talk to him about that, he said, you know, nobody don't owe you anything, right? I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, they do owe me. He said, no, they don't owe you anything because... Realistically, you gave willingly, and you shouldn't expect anything back. And if you truly gave someone, I'm like, you know what? Yes, but then I said, so if I didn't give, then that person wouldn't wouldn't have it. He said, well, yeah, but that was your choice. And right. it's, sometimes I feel like it's a catch-22 that, mm-hmm. okay, you can be a cold-hearted person and say, you know what? Screw you, I'm not going to give anything to anybody. Even now, I see a homeless person on the street, I give them money. And people look at me and say, you know they're probably drug addicts, and they're gonna. I say no, that's on their own, man. It's just like it's just one of those things, and it's just been my nature for whatever reason, you know. And I tell you a, a short little story. Um, the first time I went to the Philippines, and I was in the Navy, 
I didn't put this in the book, though. Um, this is part of the book part two. But I was in the Philippines, and, you know, we're there. We're sailors. I'm young. I was, like, 19 years old. And the guys always said, yo, you're going to love the Philippines. I said, why? He said, all these females and everything else, and that comes with it. And I was like, man, I'm not really all that. And I saw a lady walking with a daughter. And this is like broad daylight. We were like, just like in the afternoon, like 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And a bunch of us were walking, like six, seven of us walking. And we're walking along the road. And a lady came to me and said, oh, my daughter, my daughter. I'm like, what do you want? And my friend said, yeah, you, they try, she's trying to give you her daughter. I was like, what? I said, no, nah, this, is, this is not right. And I gave the lady like ten dollars. I said, "Please, just take it and go home, please." And she was like, "Thank you, thank you, thank you." And then she walked away. Then my friend said, "You know she's gonna still do it, right?" And I said, "At least my conscience is clear that I gave her the money to go home, and if, if she needs to buy food for her daughter, she can do that." And I had no control over that at that point. Yeah. But then at that moment, I also realized that you know what, I need to like educate and give back. And that's and that basically was my first time traveling to the Philippines on in the Navy. So this was like about nineteen eighty seven. But you know what? Hey, life goes on, man. I, I just whew, it's 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 tough, but you know, the guy just pushed on through. Right. So what is your hope then, uh, Andrew, when as people are listening to a conversation like this, as they pick up, prove them wrong for themselves and read it, what do you hope the book does for them? You, you've talked about your part of this, but what do you hope they're able to get for themselves? I truly hope people can read the book and realize that everyone goes through a lot of different things. There's so many more things that I went through in my life that is, is detailed in the book. And I, I persevered, you know. Um, I still helped a lot of people after that, and you know, and that you can truly go after what you want and what you believe in, and nobody should push you down. Nobody should tell you you can't do something. You know, if if it's to prove everybody wrong around you that's saying you can't do that, you can't do this. Yes, you can prove them wrong. In the sense of my grandmother told me that I wouldn't live to see 19 years old. And I had to prove, I basically proved her wrong too. See, I'm still here. And it, it's not even a bad way. It's just that because whatever you're going through in your life at that moment, people think that you can't do that or you can't accomplish that. And you will never amount to anything or you can't do. You got to prove people wrong in the sense of you truly know you and you can get out of life what you put into it. And no matter what it is, if you if you real if your mind can believe it, your body can achieve it. And it's just how it is, man. You just gotta anybody that says you can't amount to anything, can't do something, you prove them wrong and do it. You know, don't stop. Don't take no for an answer. Just keep pushing through. I'm the perfect example of that, you know? Perfect example. Exactly. Great message there, Andrew, and a great conversation with you as well. Again, everyone, Andrew Minot has been our guest. Prove Them Wrong is the book. It is available now through our friends at Amazon.com. That's where I got it from. I have the print edition. We can also get the Kindle edition there as well. Andrew, congratulations to you again, man. How can our audience stay connected with you? They can find me on all social media network, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Everything is at Drew Minot, D-R-E-W-M-I-N-O-T-T, Drew Minot. So I'm I'm available on Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook. I'm there, you know. And like I like you said, also they can get the book on Amazon, and they can also connect with me on my website. It's www.anchorminot.com. A n c h o r m i n o t t dot com. Well, Andrew, congratulations again. Looking forward to the series we're going to be doing, not only, of course, for our radio audience here in Mississippi and our Heart Radio, but also for our Amazon as well. And looking forward to our next chat together, man. I appreciate it, man. Truly did. Truly, really appreciate it. Thank you. More than welcome. Glad to have you. And we thank your audience for tuning in to another great segment of Conversations Live. Until next time, I'm your host, Cyrus Webb, saying as always, enjoy your day, enjoy your life, enjoy your world. Thank you all for choosing Conversations Live, and let's go make today amazing. Take care.